Hello, and welcome to China Forum, the leading program for discussing the latest in trends and developments in modern Chinese culture, politics, economics, and special issues. My name is Grace Carroll, and I will be your moderator for our program today. On this episode of China Forum, we are happy to welcome Mr. Alan Romberg, the director of the East Asia program at the Stimson Center. Before joining Stimson in September 2000, Mr. Romberg enjoyed a distinguished career working on Asian issues both in and out of government, including 20 years as a U.S. Foreign Service officer. Mr. Romberg was the principal deputy director of the State Department's policy planning staff and deputy spokesman of the department. He served in various capacities dealing with East Asia, including director of the Office of Japanese Affairs, member of the policy planning staff for East Asia, and staff member at the National Security Council for China. He served overseas in Hong Kong and Taiwan. Additionally, Mr. Romberg spent almost 10 years as the CV Star Senior Fellow for Asian Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations and was Special Assistant to the Secretary of the Navy. Today, we'll be talking about the recent leadership transition that took place at the 18th National People's Congress in China. To begin with, Mr. Romberg, please give us a brief overview of the National People's Congress and its role in the Chinese government. How often do these transitions occur and what positions are being filled? Actually, this was a party congress. Okay. The, the National People's Congress will occur next, next spring. Um, and the party congresses occur every five years. Uh, typically, however, the leadership, at least the very top leadership, is chosen and then stays on for 10 years, essentially, through two party congresses. In this case, an interesting development is that the highest body in the party, you start with the Central Committee, and then you have a polit political bureau, and then within that you have a standing committee. Uh, previously, the, the size of the standing committee has varied. It had been seven, and then it went to nine recently. It's just gone back to seven. Uh, Aside from the two top leaders, that is the general secretary um, and the number two man, uh, the other five people who were picked for this uh, standing committee are all going to have to retire by virtue of age uh, in five years. So it sets up a very interesting situation with consequences we really don't uh, know at this point. We can't foretell. Uh, but there were others who people thought maybe would make it to the standing committee, uh, would be more reformist-minded, uh, and, and they didn't. Now, there's a lot of speculation about what went on behind the scenes. Th these, particularly the two top leaders, are people who are generally groomed for these positions over a very long period of time. And uh, so it isn't that they're, as in an American election where you may get somebody who hasn't had any experience at these various levels, they have had. Uh, and they have very purposely been moved around to different parts of the country, different and, and rising levels of responsibility uh, before they ever get to, to this point. Uh, it is, it's, it's very important. This is a generational change. If essentially you've got the top leaders changing every 10 years, you know that the educational background, the experiential background of these people, what's happened in the world in the meantime that has formed their opinions and their value sets, have all changed from the people who are, who are being replaced. One other point I'd, I'd make, just perhaps skipping ahead a little bit in terms of what you're interested in, is that the previous uh, general secretary, uh, who is also the head of state uh, and also the head of the Central Military Commission, when he stepped down, Jiang Zemin, he held on to the Central Military Commission uh, leadership role for an additional two years. There was a lot of speculation whether uh, Hu Jintao, who just stepped down, would do the same thing. He did not. Mm -hmm. And so it p potentially creates a cleaner line of authority, um, but we'll just have to see. I think a lot of things happen behind the scenes that uh, are not, not so obvious. Uh, but uh, there is now a new leadership in place. Uh, they don't operate totally independently of those who have gone before them at all, uh, but, they, but as I say, this particular uh, step of having uh, Hu stepped down and Xi Jinping taking that position, so now he's got the party 
leadership role, the, the military commission leadership role, and in the spring he will become the head of state, uh, all uh, in, one, in one person's hands uh, is a very important development, I would say. What reason did they decide to reduce the numbers again? Will it improve efficiency? What are the w impacts that you can see about this down the line? Right, one hopes it will improve efficiency. It certainly is easier to make a decision among seven people than among nine. Uh, also, a question of whether certain functions deserve to be handled by a single member of the standing committee at that level or whether they couldn't be either combined with other functions or handled, uh, say, at the Politburo level rather than at the standing committee level. Uh, it, it's going to be hard to tell, but, but it, it should be the case that a smaller standing committee will make decisions easier. On the other hand, as I said, the other five members, other than the top two who will stay on for presumably 10 years, uh, are not viewed as uh, particularly inclined toward reform. Doesn't mean it won't happen, but uh, so, so what kinds of decisions are we talking about? Uh, many people who look at the Chinese economy, for example, feel that the current system, uh, which has been so successful and driven economic growth, double-digit economic growth for a very long time now, uh, just won't be sufficient uh, from here on out. And so they need to make some significant changes. And associated with that, because of the way the vested interests work in that economic system, political reform is also very important. One of the issues that uh, Xi Jinping already has put great emphasis on uh, is rooting out corruption. Mm -hmm. The problem is that corruption is uh, ubiquitous at all levels. And so they put a guy who uh, has been very responsible uh, for the economic successes of recent years into the role of not running the economy, uh, but of doing this role of uh, rooting out corruption. And what one doesn't know is whether because you're putting a very effective performer into that job and you have Xi Jinping, the leader, behind him, you actually will make some significant progress, or whether the fellow who's going to do this is just going to run into a brick wall. Uh, one hopes for the sake of China uh, and everybody dealing with China that there will be a fair amount of success, but it, it is a very big uh, issue, and, and we're just going to have to see how that plays out. Okay. Um, and you also mentioned that Hu Jintao decided not to take on the Central Military Commission leadership role. Do you see this as, um, what, what place does this, of course, he's, he's stepping down, but given that in the Chinese elite um, governing system, there is a lot of, um, of course, uh, backdoor uh, discussions and, and decision making that involves the elders. Do you see him continuing to take a role in decisions that are being made? Again, that's one of these things we don't know. Mm. Right? Um, I think that the, the sense is that he never had quite the same um, relationship uh, of, of, I don't know whether trust is the right word, but relationship with the military, the uniform military, as, for example, his predecessor Jiang Zemin had. Uh, Xi Jinping has some association with the military th from early in his career. Uh, and so the sense is that uh, perhaps he will be able to work um, more smoothly, if you will, and that Hu Jintao's ability, or maybe even his desire, uh, to play that backdoor role may not be so great. Uh, a lot of people say, well, but Jiang Zemin, even now, still has a fair amount of clout with the uniformed military, and that indeed in negotiating the standing committee membership, he had a lot to do with this. I think the general sense is that while one should expect that the senior leaders will continue to play some kind of role, that this particular step of who's stepping down from the Central Military Commission should mean that uh, Xi Jinping's uh, ability to function as a real leader without always having to look over his shoulder uh, will be greater than it certainly would have been if, uh, if who had stayed there. If who had stayed there, you would have had a, you know, a divided uh, chain of command. Right. Uh, and, and that really was uh, not a good situation. People say there were two precedents, one for, for staying. One was uh, Jiang Zemin stayed. Uh, the other was Deng Xiaoping. But Deng Xiaoping really was a very, uh, was a unique character. And so I would not basically argue that he 
set a precedent for this. So, so the issue was, uh, were they going to follow the Zhang precedent of staying on or not? And, and they didn't. And I, I would argue that's a good thing for China. Um, and the notion that people are now being retired due to age, they're following that, is a very good thing for China. They're regularizing this. That doesn't mean there's not a lot of back channel, back door, uh, behind the scenes maneuvering. I think there is a lot of that. And it doesn't just start, or stop rather, excuse me, at the standing committee or the Politburo or even the central committee. It has a lot to do with other people in the system and bargaining about whose guy is going to go where. Uh, and, and we know that, and uh, it's, it, it's hardly unique to China, one might say, too. Uh, but I do think that it gives Xi Jinping a, a, a clearer run at uh, trying to uh, do things efficiently uh, in a consistent way. Okay. Um, you mentioned that there's, there's a lot of um, discussions that happen behind closed doors, and I think in the lead up to the, this leadership transition, there was a lot of discussion on um, this uh, struggle between factions to see who would finally emerge as as um, the the new leaders. So a lot of China analysts look at the lineup of the Politburo Standing Committee as a signal of um, which faction um, it, which faction is winning, quote unquote, in an internal power struggle. So five to this five to seven of the members now have strong ties to former president. Jiang Zemin, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, causing some to speculate that he has he has uh, won the battle against whose faction. Is there any truth to this, or do you see this as just speculation that has no founding? Yeah, I, I, the, the truth is I don't know, and I don't think that uh, people outside China really know. I do think that there is an overemphasis on this notion of factions per se. You know, so-called princes factions, with these being the princelings, these being the descendants of original leaders uh, in the communist movement who uh, helped form the PRC, uh, and then the China Youth League faction, which uh, has its own channels. I'm sure there's something to all of this. After all, people associate with each other. Uh, th those in the elites certainly know each other and grow up and go to the same schools and, and so on and so forth. That, but that's also true in a lot of other countries. Um, I think one needs to be uh, aware that there are people with a lot of capabilities and other ties that are not factional in that sense. I'm not saying that there, has, and I, 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 that there isn't a role that Jiang Zemin played or Hu Jintao played and there, there, were, there weren't trade-offs and all the rest of that. But I think one can really overdo trying to understand where China's heading by making that kind of an analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we, we have to see, and, and they have, uh, uh, as I said, with, with Wang Qishan, who's the fellow who ran the economy and is now going to be hopefully uh, rooting out corruption, uh, you know, his expertise has really been in, in economics. And so uh, I'm sure he will continue to play an important role on the Standing Committee, but he hasn't got the lead on that issue, the Premier. Li Keqiang will have the, the, uh, the lead role on that. So anyway, my, to repeat myself, I think that undoubtedly uh, there was this horse trading. Uh, and keep in mind, of course, there also was uh, the scandal with uh, Bo Xilai, who uh, was expected to be on the standing committee. And when he was then uh, dethroned, if you will, and, and uh, now going to stand trial, um, that threw everything into a cocked hat, too. So how that actually worked out and whether people got, OK, now you're not going to get your guy because uh, Bo has gone and he was associated with so-and-so you know, and so-and-so was associated with so-and-so, I'm sure there was a lot of that. But I don't think we're in a very good position to really assess that very well. Uh, and uh, I think we should give them some time to show us what they can do here. OK, sure. As, as you've mentioned, um, in the upcoming, in this next 10-year period, I think there's going to be more emphasis on development and reform beyond just economically uh, growing the way that China has been. So do you see any of the current standing uh, committee members as being more reform-minded or likely to um, start that discussion? Well, the, the general view among P5 
people who follow leadership politics in particular is that this is not a particularly reform-minded group. And many people express disappointment that there were a couple of people they hoped would be on the standing committee uh, who didn't make it. Uh, now, that could mean in five years when these other five people retire, other than Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang, that those people and some others will come on and that there will be a better opportunity uh, to promote reform. The concern is that five years is not such a short time. And uh, so I if this assessment is correct, that these people are really not reform-minded, and if Xi Jinping is not able to forge a coalition in what you correctly described before as largely a consensus-based process, uh, that, that is a concern. Now, another school of thought is that, well, maybe Xi Jinping, in fact, can exercise greater leadership than one has come to expect from this kind of consensus uh, formation. Uh, again, we have to wait and see. I, I, I wouldn't hold out enormous hope for that, but I do think that the opportunity exists, and I think it probably exists uh, even more so in five years, when by that time, you know, Jiang Zemin uh, is, is going to be quite old if he's still alive. Uh, Hu Jintao will uh, not be uh, a young man. Uh, so, and, and a lot will have happened in the meantime in terms of, of uh, personal and uh, professional relationships. So one would like to see for the sake of success and, and not having real problems in China that they would begin a process of economic and political reform uh, in the interval, in this five-year period. But even if you don't, and assuming the system holds together, and there's some people who say, well, you, you won't have a 19th Party Congress because uh, they won't hold together. The party won't be able to keep going like this uh, due to corruption and, and the lack of appropriate policies to keep the economy producing and so on. Uh, I, I, I don't share that view. Uh, but in any case, uh, at that point, it may be that she will have a, a, a much stronger uh, hold on things. And, and if he is inclined, uh, can uh, push forward reforms at a faster pace. Okay. Um, the, thank you for, for giving us that perspective. Mm -hmm. I would like to shift to the discussion of China's foreign policy. So some observers have noted that most of the new members of the Politburo Standing Committee have experience dealing either with the U.S. or with other foreign countries. For example, Xi Jinping has visited the U.S. numerous times since he's become vice president, and he famously spent several days in Iowa um, on an agricultural mission in the 1980s. Another member, Wang Qishan, um, has been a co-leader of the strategic and economic dialogue between China and America for the last several years. So given the amount of experience that the Politburo Standing Committee members have, do we, do we think that there will be a change of attitude in how China approaches foreign policy, or will it remain mostly consistent with what has been occurring? Well, I think that right now the signs are actually not encouraging at all, because I think China's foreign policy uh, is viewed as, particularly in its own region, as uh, pretty assertive. Uh, we saw this start basically in 2010, uh, in a variety of ways in, in Northeast and Southeast Asia, it seemed to a lot of us that having seen the negative effects of that, that China then pulled back a bit uh, and, and was trying to regroup. But, but this year we've again seen a very assertive policy. So the experience of these people doesn't necessarily mean you're going to end up, because uh, these are people who've been in this system. Um, and uh, it doesn't mean you're going to end up with a much more enlightened foreign policy. I think we have to see. I'm not suggesting they, they, they can't sort of change course on this, uh, and I think it's very much in China's interest to do so. Uh, I believe that the Chinese leaders do see the importance of the relationship with the United States, for example. They, it's, it would be hard not to, just as the American leadership sees the importance of the relationship with China. But that doesn't guarantee that we're going to have uh, a, a smooth and productive uh, uh, path forward. And I, it, it, I, it is of, of concern, I would argue. Now, uh, I think that, again, people matter. So you've got this, this policy sort of in train, if you will, 
with Xi Jinping, with Li Keqiang and others in the system, not at the top leadership role, uh, roles before, but, but nonetheless in very senior roles. Okay, now they're at the top of the system. Uh, can they make a significant change? Is there an inclination because of this kind of experience uh, to make a significant change, at least in, in terms of uh, political and security policy? I'm not sure. Uh, I hope so, uh, because I think this is uh, a very uh, uh, unfortunate course that, that they're on at the moment. Um, national interest matters as in, in, greatly in, in what any country's policies are going to be, and it may be that there's a consensus among the leadership levels in China today that their national interest means they have to sort of stand up for themselves more and be less concerned about others' reactions, people need to adjust to China as opposed to China making all the, uh, the adjustments. Uh, we'll just have to see uh, about that. I would argue that's a very bad uh, course, as I say, but uh, it will also matter a lot who the people at the next level are and uh, because they're going to be providing advice. They don't make the decisions at the end of the day. Clearly, the senior leadership does, uh, but they will provide advice. They'll provide perspective. They'll provide information. Uh, and they will be the ones who will, in, in important part, be negotiating uh, more often uh, with the U.S., Japan, others uh, than, than the very top leaders will be. So I think that the experience that you cite of these people is important, and they do bring a different, they bring a different set of, of, of credentials uh, as well as those experiences, but I don't think it tells us necessarily uh, that there will be a, a, a meaningful departure, at least in any short term, uh, from from where China is today. That's actually a really good point. I, I wanted to ask, do you see the, the standing committee having, the, of course they have to walk this tightrope between domestic issues, domestic concerns, and continuing the economic growth, and foreign issues that, foreign policy issues that concern us and concern China's neighbors much more. Do you see um, any tension in the Standing Committee's approach in how they, in terms of how concerned they are about public perceptions? Do you think that it's possible that an issue in the South, South China Sea or with Japan could potentially be driven towards a more tense scenario because the government is trying to engage its own domestic audiences? I think there's a potential for that. We don't, the fact is we don't know. Mm. But I would argue that in a system like that, in any political system, but I would particularly in a system like that, it's very hard to stand up and say, but sir, uh, you know, think about this. So there w will be, I think, some reluctance uh, on people's part to buck the, the general consensus. Uh, there are a lot of people who think, for example, uh, that China just well, in May issued some new passports, which is just now uh, coming to public attention. And in those passports, they put in some delicately into pages of the passport images, which are highly offensive to China's neighbors. Uh, it, it, it's provocative in the sense that it, it reinforces the claims in the South China Sea, which, is, uh, which, which run against the claims of other countries, and yet they put them in their passport. Uh, they even ran a line up on the east side of Taiwan, which seems to say uh, Taiwan is not just part of China, which is the normal thing, but it's sort of part of the PRC, which is, is not what they say, but it seems to imply that. Uh, and other things that they did um, of that sort. Some people say, well, well, this is the foreign ministry catching up with the general trend. Uh, I don't know that. But uh, I, it, it, if, if so, it would illustrate the point that people don't want to be sort of Lo looked at as being different or, or fighting the, the problem. Uh, so I, I think in this case, uh, the leadership at the very top is going to matter a lot. Uh, and they can set a tone. And if, if Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang can bring their colleagues on the Standing Committee, first of all, along on something of this sort, of changing so that they appear less assertive, for example, uh, it's going to be a lot easier uh, than if somebody at the bottom, a professional in the foreign ministry or in some other part of the bureaucracy or even somebody in the central committee uh, wants to say, you know, we really ought to think that, th rethink that. I don't think that's uh, 
that's a very easy um, thing to do to uh, to buck that particular tide. So I, I can't answer your specific question about the dynamics, uh, but it is not a system that produces radical change uh, quickly. And uh, it does depend a lot on not just how they perceive China's national interest, but who's doing the perceiving and what are the filters through which those people are viewing situations and how much clout do they have uh, in the system. So we go back to the point about the collective. And, and uh, you know, I think that, that Hu Jintao did one thing very much as a leader, and that was to uh, reshape Taiwan policy, cross-strait policy. Uh, I think he forged a consensus among his colleagues at the top. Uh, he did so by taking a couple of positions with, which, if you will, fireproofed him from criticism, but he was able to do that. Now, w where will Xi Jinping seek to make his mark? I don't know the answer to that. And, uh, and will he have the freedom? And what will the view be of, of the PLA, the military? Uh, and uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, these are questions which are excellent questions, but we don't really have answers to at this point. Um, uh, you touched on this briefly, and again, it's China's system is so opaque, it's, it's hard to say where they're going from here. But um, just for my final question, I wanted to ask, what do you think, what, what would you speculate is at the top of Xi Jinping's list of what he hopes to do? I think very much like President Obama, for example, the economy has got to be uh, job one. Uh, they, you know, they've done very well over a long period of time, but at this point they're encountering some difficulties. You'll find different economic specialists in this country who analyze China, who have different views about how serious the problems are. But I think the consensus essentially is, and it may be wrong, that, as I said before, they're going to need to really engage in some serious economic reform if they're going to be able to continue to manage this kind of progress, uh, which is, it, I, I would repeat, is very much in our interest and I think in the interest of others. Uh, China in trouble is, puts us all in trouble. Uh, so that's not something to be, um, to be wished. So economics, um, I think, and, and that includes both domestic politics, uh, policies, uh, but also international policies, trade policies, investment policies, and so on and so forth. Uh, I think these national security issues are also going to loom large uh, for him. It depends on what happens. Uh, if the current tensions with Japan actually move to a much more serious level, so far they've kept their militaries out of it and their navies are not involved in what are very close uh, sailings. Um, then um, that becomes a much more serious issue, and he'll be forced. Uh, the leadership will be forced to look at those things. Uh, so th everything from climate change to energy security uh, to national security, and uh, and as I say, especially uh, economic performance, are really going to be at the top of uh, Xi Jinping's agenda. Okay, thank you, Mr. Romberg, for joining us today. Um, that's all the time we have. So thank you for joining us at China Forum, and we look forward to seeing you at our next show.